So I thought, I'm losing this battle and I'm losing it quick. What do I do? And I reached out to that person again. I was like, what did you say the name of that stuff was? And she said, Kratom. And I was like, well, what is it? She was like, I don't really know. I just kind of half-hearted about it. So I kind of Googled and I got to reading and I'm like, all right, I'm at my wit's end here. It's either try something and it doesn't work or I'm going to take my own life. It was just how dark it was. And until you've been in that space with chronic pain and illness, you'll never comprehend. I mean, I remember laying in my bed in fetal position and crying, like crying out from the depths of my soul for help. Welcome to Kratom Stories, a weekly podcast where we share stories of how this amazing plant has changed our lives. I'm your host, Madeline Sklar. Each week, I'll bring you a new episode featuring interviews with experts, advocates, and everyday people who've experienced the benefits of Kratom firsthand. Join me as we dive deeper into the world of this botanical wonder and discover the amazing stories behind this incredible plant. The Kratom Stories podcast is presented solely for educational purposes. Neither the podcast nor its hosts promote or endorse the use of Kratom, a substance not yet regulated or approved by the FDA. The views and opinions expressed by guests are theirs alone and do not necessarily reflect those of the host or the podcast. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions regarding the use of Kratom. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you know about Kratom Real Talk. It's a new community for positive, uplifting discussions about the power of whole leaf Kratom. If you'd like to be part of the conversation and learn more about this plant or contribute your knowledge, go to KratomRealTalk.com. So I'm here with Britt Heiser, somebody I met on TikTok. I just keep meeting amazing Kratom consumers on TikTok. Who knew that'd be a great platform? Britt, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so grateful that I found the community through TikTok. It's just been exciting to see the support. I know that Kratom's faced a troubled, rocky past and it can get ugly and personally have experienced it get ugly, but I'm excited. I love the live streams. I love the podcast. It just feels great to have a community that can relate on all the various levels and not feel like I'm alone or I'm an outcast going through what I'm going through, but also because I'm utilizing something that is a plant that's a solution, a bigger solution for a problem we face in America and is just being a blind eye turn to it because it would crash big pharma. Right. Right. I think that's why we get censored so much on social media and why we have so many issues just trying to share our truth. So that's why I started the podcast, because we're not going to get censored here. We can talk about whatever we want. And I love that. So let's start off with hearing a little bit about yourself and life before Kratom came along. So from early on in my life, I have had chronic health issues, illnesses. I mean, gosh, at 18 months old, I was in multiple hospitals. They were trying to figure out what was wrong with me. They had my parents convinced I had cancer. Again, remember this was the early 80s, so technology was not the same. And ultimately, what it was diagnosed as at that point was whooping cough. I mean, it was to the point where my parents had tried to get married prior to me being born and life kept getting in the way, but that incident scared them so much. They called my grandparents and was like, hey, can you come sit with her? We need to get to the courthouse and make this situation right for us in case anything happened. And then, I mean, gosh, I can, my mom's told stories, even my sister of me at four or five years old, having to go to the doctor well before they do now, giving allergy shots three to five times a week. And My mom used to always say, you know, had it not been for your dad and I staying together, if I had to be a single mother already having two children, there's no way I could, my whole check went to medications for you all your life. And I can remember being different as a child, just like anything that was going around school, I got it first, I got it worse. And, you know, it was like every year I knew that I was going to have ear infections, sinus infections, like clockwork. And especially as I got older, I could tell and predict like, okay, it's about to happen. And I could try to prepare as much as possible. 
And for me, those were signs back then something wasn't normal. And it took until 2023 for me to finally be diagnosed with true autoimmune issues. So, you know, I feel like they were extremely exacerbated by getting COVID twice. Let me back up. So in around 2018, I had a weight loss surgery because in my teenage years, I was diagnosed with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's where for me, my body and pancreas was not breaking down insulin appropriately. And it wasn't because I was a terrible eater that I was excessively overweight. From third grade, it was such a difference in my size to my fellow classmates that my parents began to be concerned. So they took me to the doctors and they're like, oh, it's, all, it's because she's always on antibiotics and steroids being sick. And we're dismissive of the why and sitting at getting to the root cause. But of course, they sent me to a nutritionist. So I used to have to, as a third grader, having to go to classes to learn how to eat healthy and my parents prepped everything and tried these different fad trends and it never worked. Well, when you look at being diagnosed at 17, one of the key common symptoms and side effects of having polycystic ovarian syndrome is weight, weight issues. So as I got older, trying everything, I mean, I used to go to the gym five days a week, be on the strictest of diets, and I could never budge me beyond like a 15 pound difference, no matter if I starved myself, no matter what I did. And it took one morning, I was like 33 and I woke up and I said, huh, this is how I feel at 33. I'm not going to make it when I turn 40 or 50. It's just not the life I'm going to live. I've got to try something. And speaking to my gynecologist at the time, because my life goal was to be a mother, be a parent, instill in my children good, wholesome values to dissuade some of the current ugly views of this world. My parents, I grew up holiness Pentecostal, and there are some core beliefs that I still have of that, but I look at life and people different. And I wanted the opportunity to instill that in little humans that can go be great in the world. So for years, I struggled with infertility, multiple surgeries, having cysts removed, different female procedures. And my GYN said, maybe the only thing you can do is shock your body. Just do the most dramatic thing to it. It'll reset and set a new pattern of health. So that's when I got to researching weight loss surgeries. And I was terrified, especially because back when I first learned of them, they cut you all the way open. You couldn't live alone for the first year because there was such a high risk of heart attack, all those things. I'd seen through mutual friends, people that experienced some of that. But here we are, technology's better. It's now laparoscopic. I saw someone that I worked with that had it. I didn't know that's what had happened. I just saw such a dramatic, she was out for a little bit and I knew she had had a hernia when she told me, hey, they, I also had gastric bypass and I know the struggle you've had, research it. So I did. I had my surgery in July of 2018 and 2019. I got pregnant for my first time in my 30s, but it was a topic. So I had to have, they did a repair, a tubal repair instead of removing the actual tube because it was, it was the tube with her, itself was healthy. And I was, had been the last five years really focused on my fertility and they were trying to give me as much grace as you can in that scenario. So continued on doing the things, losing the weight, using the different supplements to help with that part of my health. Six months later, I get pregnant again. Now, lo and behold, we're in heavy in the throes of the pandemic. So at that point, because of my previous history, I couldn't go without care. So I was going for labs every two days and then would have virtual visits with my doctor. And I will never forget the day when she was like, you're miscarrying. There's nothing else that you can do. It's not a you problem. You've just been dealt the unfortunate card. Like you have put in the most effort probably that I've ever seen in a patient to want this and to be as healthy as possible. She said, you've lost 170 pounds. You've done the work. So I really struggled with that for a while. And I'm like, okay, I'm closing Pandora's box. I'm putting it away. It's just not meant to be. Then we fast forward, COVID is getting worse. I get it. And I knew when I got it, had I gotten it a year earlier, even six months earlier, it would have killed me because all my life I had asthma and all the health issues and all the things. 
even though at that time the weight loss was gone, I was off any kind of medication for things like prediabetes, high blood pressure, all the things. I hadn't had to use an inhaler and by that point in two or three years, which was not normal because I had activity induced asthma. So COVID hit me and it hit me hard. I lost 12 pounds in a matter of a week. I could, and I lived alone at that point. My parents were in another state. My partner lived about 35 miles away in another town, which was an hour, really an hour drive away. And I had to fend for myself as well as care for a fur baby in the throes of COVID. And it just, I mean, I've been sick all my life. When I get sick, I don't get simple sick. I get multiple things at a time, you know, ear, double ear infection, sinus infection, flu. Oh, you've got a UTI on top of all these things, that kind of sick. And I never had experienced anything that could, could even compare to COVID. So it took me about four months after COVID get to what I thought was a sustainable normal, but it wasn't the normal that I knew, you know, in the first year or so of my new life after having my weight loss surgery, because honey, I would have energy and go from 5 a.m. to one o'clock in the morning, sleep for five hours and pop right back up. Like it was such a dramatic change for me and I can go and do and work and all the things that wasn't the case after COVID. So we moved forward. I just knew something wasn't right. I could, no matter what I did, my energy was on the floor and I don't know if a lot of people know this or familiar, but once you have weight loss surgery, you're on vitamins for the rest of your life. We're not getting the same nutritional value anymore that the average person does. So it wasn't because, oh, you just need to take vitamins. I was taking the maximum allowed of the daily recommended limits of everything. And it would I would never get better. And I noticed that I started to hurt in different places that weren't the average pain from where I'd carried all that weight. At my highest weight, I was around 330 to 350 pounds and I'm only 5'5". Five five. So I knew that after I lost that weight, there would there was going to be some some joint issues that had carried that weight and I, it had a toll, you know, took a toll. But I just felt like it, as I got further away from how bad I felt with COVID, I still just felt terrible and terrible. So I started going to doctors and I always knew that I had some degenerative issues with some discs in my back. But because I was so young, their answer to me was always lose weight, lose weight. Well, I pulled my card. I'm like, hey, I lost 170 plus pounds. That's not the answer anymore. There's something not right. So they put me in pain management. I was there about three years. Things just were not helping. And having two family members that have been addicts since I can remember, except for one gracefully, has finally entered rehab as of April this year after 31 years. I was terrified to be in pain management. I literally wanted to only use the medication when I had to have it to function, meaning to get to and from work and make it through the day. And then I would spend the rest of my day in bed in pain because I wasn't I wasn't going down a path that I'd seen my brother and sister go down. Now they're started for different reasons. Recreational is in their teenage years. But again, for me, that hold a very, held a very scary place for me. And I had to switch due to insurance. And I'm so grateful for the nurse practitioner that I got. She was the first person that actually listened to me. She asked questions and she said, well, based off what you told me, I can tell you have autoimmune issues. I said, I've been fighting for that for three years to be tested because when I was in high school, my grandmother was diagnosed with lupus. Now hers has been in remission for quite a while, but I knew some of the signs and symptoms. So I knew within myself, I was almost guaranteed. I'm like, I have it. Nobody will listen to me. I'm too young. They think I'm crazy. All the things, the dismissive, the brushing off, the think you're see- they think you're seeking medications that are narcotic. For me, that was never my story. And when I would have to go into a care provider that was going to be handling medications. My thing is, if you're giving me a narcotic, I want to take it no more than a year. That's That was my boundary. So if I, I come in telling you this, but you're still trying to stigmatize me, what options are there for me? So with this doctor in April of 23, I was finally di- diagnosed with lupus, psoriatic arthritis, Epstein-Barr, degenerative disc disease, which I knew all along, but nobody would ever listen. And it took at least the last eight years of hardcore forcing doctors 
telling them, coming in and saying, hey, I need this test done. Here's all my reasons and the back and forth. Well, then losing access to healthcare through losing my job. At that point, I was on what they call biologics that had made a difference. There was still a huge gap for me in how I felt and being able to live what I considered to be a normal everyday functionality. Energy was still terrible. I had in some places less pains, but I still would have major flares with the lupus and the psoriatic arthritis. It didn't matter how much I changed my behaviors, my eating habits. It just would get to a certain point and never progress to be any better. And having conversation with somebody that lived in my community at the time mentioned their ex-partner had used it to help them get off drugs. And I was like, eh, then that's definitely not something for me because that's a space I'm not in. She's like, no, a lot of people use it for pain and for energy. You should look into it. So I dismissed it. And I think I was on my second month of not being able to afford because I had a 12 month prescription for my biologic injections of Humira that we tried every avenue, thousands of dollars a month. And even getting a, an insurance plan through something like healthcare.gov, the challenges I faced, the medications that I needed that made me not my best, but better were still massive co-pays, $150, $350. And here I am unemployed from the corporate world of a career, 24 years being in you know, executive and leadership roles, having great jobs, doing all the right thing. And I couldn't get care. And I just progressed down this path of being more in pain and more flares and sicker and sicker and sicker. And there were days I couldn't get out of bed. I could do the best to get to the bathroom and maybe get down my steps to let my dog out. And I would have to sit in a chair in the doorway and watch my dog. And then it got so dark for me that I was like, I understand why people commit suicide now. After all the years of fighting with the doctors, them not listening to me, believing, not even trying to prove me wrong. I would be happy for you to prove me wrong. If I'm telling you this is what's going on, run that test. How's it hurting you? It's actually putting money in your pocket because I'm paying for these tests. Prove me wrong. And, And still facing all the adversity that I faced. I was in a very dark place and I was like, okay, what can I do? especially being gastric bypass, I couldn't even take something as simple as an over-the-counter NSAID. You can't take those. And so I got every kind of ointment, every kind of cream you could think of. I tried herbs. Well, having the allergies that I do a lot of times when I tried herbal stuff, I would have negative reactions. Sure, they might fix my one problem, but they gave me 15 other. I'd break out in hives. I'd get a rash. I'd get sick. So I thought, I'm losing this battle and I'm losing it quick. What do I do? And I reached out to that person again. I was like, what did you say the name of that stuff was? And she said, Kratom. And I was like, well, what is it? She was like, I don't really know. I just, you know, was kind of half-hearted about it. So I kind of Googled and I got to reading and I'm like, all right, I'm at my wit's end here. It's either try something and it doesn't work or I'm going to take my own life. It was just how dark it was. And until you've been in that space with chronic pain and illness, you'll never comprehend. I mean, I remember laying in my bed in fetal position and crying, like crying out from the depths of my soul for help, but also somebody to understand that it wasn't about some kind of pain medication. I just wanted to be able to wake up every day and be normal, go have lunch with my friends and not have to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then when it's time to get out of bed and have to take a shower, the amount of energy it took for me to be able to take care of myself, basic everyday life activities, couldn't do them, you know, consistently for myself. And then that messes with you mentally. And then looking around the household chores that I couldn't do because I was in such pain and I was always sick and feeling like, you know, that achy flu run down, couldn't stay awake for longer than an hour at a time. I Googled where to find it. And I know a lot of people are against getting it from a smoke shop type place. But at least it wasn't, in my mind, it was like, at least it wasn't a gas station. My biggest space of fear with trying to use Kratom is, in my early 20s, somebody had mentioned about using marijuana, different versions of it for pain, for somebody who had chronic, massive, like golf ball and orange size cyst on my ovaries that would require surgery. I had tried the street version Weirdly enough, of course, which it fits with who I am, it exacerbated my pain. So at that point, 
in my twenties, I was like, I got to try it again. You know, you tried it when you were younger, you never know your body's different. So I listened to someone and went and bought K3, the most fearful thing I've ever done in my life. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I texted my partner at the time. I said, listen, you know, that stuff K3. And he was like, yeah, did you do it? And I said, I did. And I'm sorry. He was like, I'm not judging you. I understand what you're going through. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry, because I think it's going to kill me from using it. The activity of I sat in my car and had consumed it through smoking. By the time I got out of my car, walked up the steps in my town home, my heart felt like it was going to explode. It was beating out of my chest. I could hear it in my ears. Everything just was in a morbid, scary state. And I managed to get into my guest bedroom in my townhouse at the time. And I was I was laid out flat looking at the ceiling and my heart's racing and I'm I'm terrified. But I'm also like, I can't call 911 because I'm afraid I'm going to go to jail, you know, especially my 19 don't know, you know, that space. And so I text basically my dear John goodbye letter in case by the time he had gotten off work, come home and found me dead because I just knew I was going to have a heart attack. So from that point on in my life, I was very leery about trying stuff from gas stations or smoke shop. But here I am in 2023 in a state of, to me, it was life or death. What do I do? Either it's going to hurt me because I try it or it's going to hurt me because I don't. That's literally the state of mind I had going into it. So my best friend happened to be in town and I set her down and I said, listen, this is what I'm about to do. Somebody told me about this stuff. I'm not really sure I understand what it is. I want you to look out for these symptoms. I'm about to consume it. And at that time, I had gotten it in capsules, even though I sh- I'm not supposed to take capsules. For me, I'm like, well, I can deal with a little stomach irritation and indigestion if, if what's in it works. And then I'll figure out those kinks later, one hurdle at a time. So I tell, I give my best friend this list of like, if I start foaming at the mouth, I have seizures, my eyes roll in the back of my head, my breathing gets crazy. Here's two things of Narcan. I don't know what I thought that was going to do, but I was preparing for the worst. I was like, if you see any of these things, you call 911 right away. I wrote down for her what, what I had taken. So I popped my first capsule and I set a timer on my phone for one hour. And I'm like, now we're in nothing. And I'm like, Well, here goes another failed attempt at something working. And I just laid there and I thought, well, let me Google some more how to really take it. And then something said to me, dummy, you didn't take it right. And I was like, I didn't take it right because I didn't understand the capsules to the gram, the whole mathematical part. Like I'm I'm in human resources. I'm a people person. I'm not a number person in any way. So I was like, this particular brand didn't have the most clearest dosage explanation to me, to somebody who's new to this. So I said, all right, friend, I'm going to take two more. I've got, I already got one down the hatch. Let's take two more and see what happens. Within an hour max, I could tell the difference. I was like, whoa, okay. So let's time and see how much I feel, how long I kind of feel some relief. And I was making it about three and a half, four hours with improved mobility of my limbs, actually feeling like I could walk from point A A to point B without passing out. I'm like, okay, this might be something. So while she was in town, I was able to rip and run like I hadn't in quite a while. I mean, we went and swam and we went out to dinners and to the, the bars to have, like, I was this whole new social person that I hadn't been Even when I had, before I lost my weight, I was pretty social, but I still couldn't be as active as I wanted because I was restricted, right, in my ability. So I'm like, okay, this is pretty great. And I started going to the shop because it's actually more so a CBD-based shop that has a tremendous variety of of Kratom now, especially. And they also sell some vapes. But the more I talked to the guys in there and they told me their stories, you know, one of them having been an addict on everything under the sun to the most extreme levels, using it to while he detoxed from them and he replaced the, the terrible habits of those drugs with a healthy habit of Kratom. I'm like, gosh, if he can do this, then I definitely can. So I began to play with determining because I started with the Ming Da and for I'd say about a year, that was my end all be all like that gave me life. That, that kept me from wanting to kill myself. That kept me going. I was living my best life that I should have been living from 
when I lost all that weight and the new me and the energy and the go and the, the just inner confidence that comes from such a transition, I was, far, I was finally getting to live it, you know? But then I started getting headaches and I'm like, uh, okay, either, you know, the answer most people gave me was, oh, you're just not in taking enough water. Well, as a gastric bypass patient, the standard baseline amount of water that we intake on an average day is 60 to 100 uh, milligrams of water a day, which is kind of the baseline for every adult. But most people, the average person doesn't meet that. So I'm like, no, there's no way. There's no way. Because at this point, I wasn't able to drink anything but bottled water with flavor packets that was it. I wasn't, there wasn't the zeros. It couldn't have carbonation or anything. So I just kept toughing it out and I'd take some Tylenol with it. And then the more I understood about the different strains and really researched and talk, kept talk, I just kept talking to my guys there at, at the shop and the, listened to their recommendations and just played with it to where now I have a pretty good mix for me that white really helps a majority of my overall body aches and joint aches and crummy feeling and a green gives me that go to get up to not just lay there and veg because I have the pain. And then it kind of tapers that last little edge of pain that the white may not always get. And then I just rotate out probably about every three months, the particular vendor that I use and my routine as far as on a daily basis, I Probably dose about four times a day, anywhere from three to six grams in a dose, depending on if I'm in a flare or not. And something that really affects me is weather. If we've got terrible weather coming, even a few days before, while it's here and until it's passed on out of my area, my body is in a tremendous amounts of pain and I can't sleep. So, you know, I can predict essentially the weather before our local news person because of these issues. And so I just kind of play with it. And one great thing that you brought into my life has been the blade paste. Oh my gosh. Because when I, once I played with the capsules a little bit, I couldn't do those very long and I was having the negative issues. I was basically dry scooping my liquid, my tea, either tea or coffee, something to definitely mask that taste straight to the throat, dry shot. And it was rough. It gave me indigestion and stuff, but with the blade papes, man, I can make up my daily doses of both strains, have them in my little color coordinated Ziplocs, just pop it and go. Because I had, there was a brand that was accessible to me for a little while of press tablets. They were great. However, the yield to dosage amount was you were taking so many to get to your three grams or your two grams, and it just was not cost effective. And my store had had them for a while and nobody was really interested in them because, you know, they were, just weren't cost effective and, and just the amount you had to take. And by the time I knew that I had to try to find another way to take my Kratom, they're like, oh, we'll try these. And so those became my go to like when I knew I was going to travel or be out in public because it's odd to say, hold on, let me take a drink and throw back some powder and all the things that happen. It's usually spilled all over you. You're or you didn't get enough squid, so you're like now coughing and it's gone up your nose, like all the things have been there. So I use that because of the cost and just the amount. Because I think the particular brand, I had to take about six or eight of the tablets to equal my basic minimum three gram dose. And the packs literally came with 20 in them. So when I got the blade papes at first, I was kind of like, this is going to be a little weird. But when I started the routine of pre-making them. So as soon as my eyes roll over, it's kind of bad. As soon as my eyes go open, I have some pre-made. I reach over. I have my jug of either tea or water that stays in my not Stanley on the nightstand and, and can pop it. And while my body is coming awake within that 15, 30 minutes that I lay there before my alarm and can get straight out of bed and not have to wait for something to kick in, Oh, the last, the last few, I think I've been using them about four weeks now. It's made a world of difference for me and in my routine. And just, I don't have to be ashamed to try to do it out in public because it looks weird and people don't understand. And, you know, even my mom had asked me, she's like, what is that? I don't understand. I was like, it's a natural plant that has made your daughter be who she is because where I was, 
is not who you wanted to know. And that was a place of shame that I couldn't share with you how dark it was until I got out of that darkness and found a solution. Again, as I mentioned, I grew up Pentecostal. So my parents are very adverse to natural homeopathic things. And so they were kind of like, my mom was kind of judgmental indirectly. I felt it in her spirit. But then about two weeks after the first time I mentioned, because I had been taking it probably for two or three years by that point. She was like, what did you tell me that stuff was again? And what is it doing for you? And I'm just like, okay, yeah, I do. Now that I think about it, I've been hearing you mention less often about how bad you feel or the pain. She was like, well, that's good. That's good. It seems like it's something more natural. As before she got into the faith, this is someone who was in the 60s that was all into the herb life. And, you know, she looked up to Bo Derek to to get her to finally reach back into that space that she was, you know, in her late 20s, early 30s of being more self-aware and in tune to there being alternatives than what we've been given by Big Pharma. And then understanding as as I recently have been able to get closer to my sister, since she's now in a rehab willingly, the first time in my life she ever reached out to me and says, hey, can you help me find somewhere? And she also at times, in her times of sobriety, she was using Kratom, but the state that she was in, it was an elite, illegal. So she had to drive to the next state and get it at a gas station. And I was like, that's the worst of the worst, the bottom of the barrel. But it helped her enough to where she may not have been 100% sober, but she was off the most extreme things like the heroin and the meth at times because of the Kratom. And just hearing and seeing people's stories on TikTok and through the podcast and the things of the vast variety of solutions that this plant brings to me is phenomenal. And I understand why it's it's banned in some states because that's big pharma's money that we're messing with. And they're afraid to shift that money away from, you know, all the big politicians and big corporations that are bankrolling off of people. But then yet you have the DEA involved in all these restrictions and these new laws because they think that most of the people who face addiction is because of them getting it prescribed to them and using it accurately. That's not where addiction streams from. That's not what has led to this crisis of opioid addiction in America. It's that gray space between when you cut off those patients because whatever the clinic closes down or those patients ha- are turned, it's the street side of that, that they should really be reeling in and they could use Kratom to help people taper off all of the illicit drugs and be healthier and function. Again, I've, uh, the guys that I, at the um, shop where I get my Kratom, that one guy just showed me pictures of, of him at the time and how it literally has given him a whole new life and he's literally a new person. And just seeing the difference it's made in my life, I know that if I hadn't given Kratom a try at the time I did, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be moving on through this thing called life to see and have found have found your podcast and your, your page on TikTok. I would I know I wouldn't have. And that hurts me to have to say that because, you know, growing up, we had family members that committed suicide because mental health has been a very big thing in my family. And it's and the Kratom has helped me in that way too, because not only just the energy has it boosted, but it has triggered the kind of dopamine endorphin feel that you get with the highs and lows that I was at rock bottom. I was dark. I was so dark from being dismissed, being downplayed because I'm a woman with pain and, oh, you are just dramatic. And who else can know my body but me? And if I'm telling you something very specific and very accurate and detailed, there's no way I've read that off the internet. So I could come back in and say, hey, these things are it because I want a pill. Because really, I don't want to have to take something every single day, multiple times a day, just to be normal. Nobody does. But I'm grateful that I have Kratom to take to be as close as to normal I'll ever be because that's not something I've ever seen my entire life, having chronic illness and health issues since I was born. Your story, Brett, is amazing. I mean, I'm just like sitting here, just like, I don't even have to interject at all. 
I'm just wowed by your story. I'm sure our listeners are wowed too. I mean, you've been through a lot your entire life. Yeah. Yep. That's wild. Oh my gosh. And congrats to you for like just really, you know, speaking out and trying to get diagnosed with the things. I mean, there's so much gaslighting. That's all you hear on social yes. media, all the people in the chronic pain community getting gaslit. I'm sure I have something that is autoimmune, but doctors just don't listen. They don't listen. No. I know I'm definitely been undiagnosed for years. I, I also like was with somebody when they got diagnosed with Sjogren's. I know all the symptoms and I've had all the same symptoms for years. And they just, it's really disappointing when it is. we rely on these healthcare professionals to take care of us and listen to us and they don't. And we have to advocate for ourselves all the time. I have a couple of questions. I mean, just this conversation's amazing. Do you feel like Kratom helped you with, because you had COVID, it sounded like you were having long COVID, like you had a lot of issues because of COVID. Do you feel like, because I don't hear too many people talk about Kratom after having COVID, like it really helped them as dramatically as what you were describing. Do you feel like that's something that could help more people that have been through COVID? Yes. If they really work with the different strains that would work best for them, because it's not a one size fit all. It's not a one strain handles this across the board. And it, it, it did take me a little time of going back and forth to really get to where I am today, because there were times I thought, ooh, I'm taking too much, or I'm going to have to taper myself down because I've built up an immunity. And it wasn't creating the rotation of brand, the order in which I take it, you know, even something as simple as I know I use white and green. But what I do now, if I start my day one day with my white, then the next day I start it with my green. Just it's the give and take and being willing to find your own solution that I think has made the most difference for me. And you're right, no doubt that I was having issues with the long COVID, but I think it exacerbated the autoimmune issues that I already had going on in my life and just really made them rear the ugliness to where doctors finally could no longer ignore what I was telling them. And I definitely thought about what if I had found out about Kratom when I had COVID? Yeah. Like, I'm curious because now, like, even if I get a cold or something, it still helps me feel better than I normally would by taking something over the counter. Yeah, a lot of people say that. I've heard of so many people say that. The other thing you'd mention that I go through as well is the weather. I have way more pain with it. Like we've been having nonstop thunderstorms yes. here in Houston and it just makes my back hurt more, my neck hurt more. Kratom helps tremendously. But even when I was in pain management, taking opioids for nine years, the weather would affect me. Like, I'm just yes. like you. For me, though, it's not every time. I would say for me, it's about, I would say, 70% of the time, I know when a storm's coming. It's mm -hmm. usually the day before because all of a sudden my back will hurt out of nowhere. Whereas normally with Kratom, my back and neck issues, I, I hardly even notice that I have degenerative disc disease. And so I get that warning sign. And then many times it'll really bother me while it's happening. And I usually don't take extra Kratom. I'm kind of at a point where like, if I take extra Kratom, it's not going to help. Like, you know, mm -hmm. many of us, like if you try to take more, it'll just make you feel crappy or yeah. make you nauseous. So I take what my limitation is with dose. Like I take the max mm -hmm. I could take. What do you do? Like, do you take extra Kratom when you're having storms and bad weather? Does anything help? Just curious. Sometimes I do, or even just switching the brand of the Kratom that I'm taking to kind of trick my body or recalibrate my body to the level of relief that I get. I mean, the heating pad is my best friend. Like, yeah. I don't go anywhere without it. Like my office chair has the built-in heated pillows. I have the heated padding in my, that goes on your seat in your car. Like that is a must for me. Different topicals. You know, I was, I traveled with roll on like a leaf because I couldn't ingest it. And recently through TikTok, I have found the most amazing CBD based product that I have ever used in my life because I had tried CBD initially after my weight loss began because I've always had sciatic issues because of the weight essentially. And it worked for a little while. And then we had COVID and I couldn't get it because they were towns away. And I was, my friend through work was buying it because she was closer. 
And then a couple months into the pandemic, they started shipping. But overall, they just didn't survive the pandemic and closed. So then I just got off that journey because I'm like, it helped enough at that time. But I did notice as I began to, the more weight I lost, the weirder it made me feel like as if I'd actually ingested or smoked marijuana. And I don't like that heady, uh, what do they call it? The like psychedelic out of, I just have never been that person. And so I followed this creator for a while on um, TikTok and seeing their product. And I'm like, okay. And especially having been unemployed for well over a year, I'm like, I got to figure out a way to afford it, to try it. It's not like I haven't wasted plenty of money on other over-the-counter solutions that all they do is make me stink. You know, they just have a horrid, medicated nursing home smell and people know you're coming and that you have the problem you have because they smell you. And so I got it Monday and they had, you know, different levels, like starting at 350, 1,000, 1,350 and 2750. So I'm like, I'm going to go one below the top just because I know it takes a lot of anything with my body. And when I tell you I'm out now because it was that phenomenal and I used it on that many different locations in my body. Back in April, I broke my left arm. Well, I also had broken it when I was in third grade. So that re-aggravated an old injury. And so I like put it on my continually put it on the left arm on my right shoulder that for almost three years, I had less than 40% mobility in it because of some of it is from the psoriatic arthritis where it has literally degenerated my joint. Almost a thousand percent sure that I have a tear in my rotator cuff and probably I'll find that out next month. Injections, they were giving me steroids and even narcotic injections into it, different prescription medications that did not. And when I tell you for a whole six days, because it was very small, it was uh, I got a, a small size, it was like two ounces between the shoulder, my spine, because as you mentioned, we've been having the same amount of rain. And so I have really bad degenerative issues in my lower back and my neck and putting it on my you know hip down to my ankle for my sciatic nerve. Like I was the best me I had been in a long time. I was ripping and running, you know, cleaning the house in ways I haven't been. So immediately I went back and bought almost $300 worth of product. Well, wow. thanks to Microsoft and the outages, the guy's web pay and all that was down on his side as the retailer. And so it's just now coming back up and it'll be shipped out next week. And really today is the first day that I did not have any that I could scrape out of the jar and put oh. on. So, and of course it would really thunderstorm this morning and I'm like, oh my God, I forgot. Like when I tell you for something to work so good, you literally lose sight of how bad that pain was. And then when that bad pain comes back, you're, I was shook. Like, how have I lived so long with this, this pain like this? Cause this is horrible. Right. And so I, of course I go back to my old faithful roll on a leave and here I am smelling, can smell me from a mile away. It only gives about a 5% relief. But to me, it, anything that reduces my inflammation or my pain by a percent, I'll consider it a win because I've bought and tried so much stuff that literally did nothing. And again, when I first tried Kratom, that capsule, I was like, well, this is 30 bucks down the drain, you know, kind of. And then it was just the craziest thing. Something said to me, you didn't take it right. Go back and read the package, dummy. And I reread it a couple of times for it to make sense to me that I wasn't taking it correctly. But there are times that I do, especially when I'm using the blade papes, instead of doing a three gram little, I use either the cones or make my own, eat a little pouch. I'll do maybe four and a little over, or I will mix in my predominantly white, just a little bit of green. And that kind of fills the gap a majority of the time. I will say it's it's not 100% everything's gone and better, but it's 100% giving me a better life than I would have ever had in the condition that I was in before. It's amazing to see how much Kratom has helped you. And I, I'm so yeah. glad you came on the podcast to tell your story. I have one last question yeah. for you. So knowing everything that you know now about Kratom, 
I mean, you figured out a lot over this time. What advice would you give to someone else to help them get started in their own journey? Ask questions, research, find good quality vendors, find your community. It's going to be trial and error. That's the key. Don't give up. Don't give up trying to find the right mix, trying to learn about it. Like again, every, you know, it depends on the size I buy. I might go every 10 days or I might have to go about every two and a half weeks. I'm in there asking questions or just talking to them about what I've seen or learned differently and learning. For me, I feel like Kratom is something that I don't want to stop learning about. I want to keep continuing finding out better ways to consume it, better ways to talk about it and get more people to use it because it has made the most tremendous difference for me in my life, for sure. And again, trial and error. It's not a one size fits all. I know this episode is going to help so many people, Britt. Thank you for coming on and sharing this amazing story with us. Absolutely. So I did want to touch on one thing. I'm in a state where Kratom is legal. However, this past weekend, I went on a trip with my friend and because the weather was so bad once I got there, downpour, thunderstorm, hail, I was leaving out Sunday into Monday morning because I had to be home to work. And it was like 1 30, 2 o'clock in the morning. And I was in a very red area. I didn't know that it was red. So as I started to see these Trump specific stores, I felt an imminent fear in me for some reason. Well, next thing I know, I'm getting pulled over and it was supposedly for a headlight being out. And I'm like, what? Let me twist it again. I see no different. It looks from my point of view, the lights are working. I haven't been pulled over in probably 15 years or more. So that was the thing. I'm in someone else's car. I'm driving my best friend's car, who also happens to be a black woman. So I thought, all right, here it goes. We're about to have some problems. And the officer mentions, oh, you seem nervous. I said, well, I am because I'm driving my best friend's car. Said, so, you know, it's someone else's vehicle. So I would rather be in my own vehicle, but it's having some air conditioning problems. She was like, why in the world would you be leaving at this time of night? And I said, well, I was supposed to leave out Sunday morning, but it's been pouring and hailing. It was just not safe for me to drive that four and a half hour drive down through the mountains back home. So she asked for her license and I'm like, oh gosh, I forgot to ask. Make sure her registration and insurance, it's just autopilot when you get into a car most times. So she says, all right, get her stuff. And for me, I'm can still carry. I've had it for a long time. I did not have my weapon on me that time. But when I get pulled over, I have a certain protocol that I follow that makes me comfortable, that meets the requirements of me being concealed and carry. And I didn't do a step in it because she, just, I just, the energy was just bad. And that triggered me to be even more anxious. And for me, it's like, I always have my hands open flat against the wheel. I have my license already in my hand. If I have my weapon, I have it where they can see it. And I don't move without telling them, this is what I'm doing. I'm about to reach and grab because I've seen too many in my personal life, too many things happen to people I know just because of the amount of fear and not communicating. And when she told me to get the registration out of the glove box, I leaned before I processed and as I reach, that thought came in my mind. You didn't tell her what you were going to do. You could have been shot right away. Wow. And that that threw me. That threw me. And I was a mess. Like, I was like, you could see my hand trembling. Well, by that point, she was convinced that I was on something. I was like, okay, here we go. So she comes, the odd thing is she comes back to the window and she was like, well, everything's okay, but I need you to step out. And I'm like, what? Didn't you just tell me everything was okay? That's kind of conflict. But I'm like, all right, it's going on two o'clock in the morning. I had a certain time that I had to be back in town by. Just don't make it any worse on yourself. So she asked me to walk to the back of the vehicle and stand at the front of her cruiser. And then I noticed, wait a minute, she's called for backup. I'm like, is she serious right now? Like, what is really going on? What is the true reason behind all this? So then she tells me, I've never seen someone be so nervous when I pulled them over. You have to be under the influence of something. And I'm like, nope, I'm just nervous because I psyched myself out in my head because I 
there are certain things that when I do them in life, I have to follow them in that routine or it triggers anxiety anxiety in me. And also the fact that I've literally spent all of Saturday in bed because it was such bad rain that nothing was helping me. So I'm dealing with an excruciation amount of pain that you could never understand. But again, I shouldn't have to explain all this to you. So she's like, well, I'm going to search the vehicle. I said, well, it's not my vehicle, so I can't give you that permission. Well, she didn't like that I knew my rights and she didn't like that I knew better. And she was like, well, when you drive someone's vehicle, you have eminent domain. I said, uh, eminent domain has to do with property. We're not doing this. <laughs> we're not, we're not doing this. And the Oh little, my uh, God. They're just trying to find a way in, aren't they? Yes. And so the wow. little officer that she had called for backup, he's the literate. I can see him over there. Like he's just, <laughs> he just, he knows what's about to happen. I was like, you know what? I don't even care. I don't care. You can search the vehicle. I'll explain whatever I need to explain to her. Now, we had also been moving some of her stuff prior. So there's a lot of stuff still in the vehicle. So I was like, yeah, you have fun searching that. When I tell you this police officer, I get searching. But when I tell you she literally deconstructed everything in the vehicle, took apart every one of my bags, left it strewn all over the vehicle. I had leftovers from dinner that night ink to go containers that she dumped out in the plastic, like sheer viciousness. I was like, okay, I see you girl. You're, wow. you're, you're mad because you met your match. You're mad. Cause you met your match. <laughs> you thought you had one. You ran those tags right close to the orange man store. Like I I'm just a very, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I am. I am very aware. I'm very self-aware. And I, I just instantly started piecing stuff together. So after she's, and oh, I also had my dog with me. So when she goes to search the car, the first thing I said is, um, can I please get my dog? Because if that is my emotional support animal, she's registered because I have major anxiety issues. And if you lose her <laughs> because she's terrified, then we're going to have bigger problems than you, than you want to deal with. And so she's like, okay, so I get my dog and I have her and I am calming down. And the other officer is telling me his life story that he lived in the county that my best friend's tags are in, talking to me about his grandfather having COVID, going on, like he gives no Fs about why this woman has called him for backup. He sees that I'm not a threat, that she is out of her mind, but she didn't like being challenged. Yeah. So he he literally is, he is talking about anything under the world. I mean, anything like it was so much, I can't even recall the different stuff that we talked about as long as it took her to search. So then she comes to the back and she's starting to peel off her, her glove. She said, so where did you get that green stuff, Kratom? I said, oh no, it's legal. And we're not even going to have this conversation. She's like, well, it wasn't, then it was. I said, for at least the last five years in my state, Kratom has been legal. She said, well, maybe that's why you're shaking so bad because you're under, I said, so you're going to try to say that I'm wow. under the influence of Kratom well, how often do you take it? And when is the last time you took it? I said, at dinner time. And how many times a day I take it? It's none of your business. If, I said, if you're going to try to get me on DWI, you better arrest anybody who takes an antacid, an Advil, an ibuprofen. You don't want these problems, ma'am, because I'm not the one. She was like, well, you think because I noticed you have an energy drink, mind you, a zero sugar energy drink. She was like, maybe they're conflict. And I said, nope, I do that at least two times a week. It's not that, it's you, ma'am. Your vibe, your aura, and your behavior triggered in me because I know and sense bad in people. And my dog even alerted it to it when someone has ill intentions or a bad spirit on them. And this is not how we're going to go. She was like, Well, I guess I'll let you get out of here, but I can't promise in your four hour ride back to Nashville that you won't get pulled over again. I said, And I'll have the same conversation because I'm not doing anything illegal. I, nothing. And of course, I go down the road once I get back in the car and I'm just at the fuming. I could just feel it coming. It was guttural at this point. Like I had so much rage because I'm putting the pieces together. I'm like, because when I pulled out of my hotel, not even 200 feet on this side of the road, because we had to turn out and then get over in the far lane and they have a cutout for you to do a legal U-turn because it was on the strip of uh, Gatlinburg. Well, we were in Pigeon Forge Park. There was a cop sitting right there. If my headlight was out, they would have stopped me before I pulled out of that parking lot. And then something she said made me think, so you've been following me for a while. If you knew that I stopped at the gas station where I went in to get the energy drink, I would have noticed the lights being out then because with my dog being with me, I always leave the vehicle running. 
and the car locked. I have to walk in front of the headlights to get, you know, to the store. It just was, I already have perspective on it about things that African-American people face in our society, because that's my closest circle of people. And to have experienced it and almost been in a space, you can't compare the two, but it gave me even more of an understanding and a rage that I came home. I didn't get home till 530 in the morning because of this. I came home and I was like, what can I do to get active now? What can I do to be even more involved in the causes? Because this has got to stop. And it was right around the time that Biden stepped down and Kamala was endorsed. I'm like, oh, baby, if we don't, that instance that I just experienced is going to be a million times worse for everybody else. And we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. If this election goes to Donald Trump again, we will be in trouble. And so I called my best friend. I was like, you're not going to believe the wild experience that I had. I'm sorry for any time in your life that you've ever had an encounter like this. And she was like, yeah, but you're right. She said they had to have ran my tax. And she also carries because that was one of the first things she was like, where's the weapons? Oh, I I didn't even give her my carry and conceal permit because in our state, they're separate. Unless you have an open carry, then it's on your license. I said, oh, I'm licensed, but my weapon's not with me. And her weapon is back in the hotel with her. So I knew... She called out too many things in the very beginning that triggered so many flags for me. And people are like, well, why don't you report it? For what? It does nothing. When you're in somewhere that has super stores, <laughs> super stores of nothing but Donald Trump, that's an ugly place to be. And I decided I was like, I hadn't been there since I was probably eight or nine. I will not go back as long as that stays the environment up there. And there wasn't just one. There was many, like at least four to five. Wow. What an experience you had. Did this police officer know what Kratom was? Was she she, aware of what it was? Somewhat. She knew enough to say, oh, that she was trying to tell me it was illegal. And I instantly shut that down. She was like, well, it went back and forth. It was, and then it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. I said, well, at least within the five years that I've known about it and the three and a half I've been using it, it's been legal. It is definitely legal in my state. Yeah. Wow. Well, good for you with not letting her control yeah. the situation to the point where you sound like they were, she would have tried to arrest you for it. Yes. Because every other attempt had failed, yeah. her last hope, her last little hoorah was going to be the Kratom and that I was driving while impaired. Wow. It was not, she was not winning. Well, this is a good time in the conversation to remind our listeners, understand the legality of Kratom where you live. It is sadly banned in six states currently. We almost got Rhode Island undone. It's because of like what you were saying earlier, big pharma. They just don't want us consuming a plant that's way better than the expensive pharmaceuticals, which is sad. They definitely don't want us better. They want us trapped. Yeah, exactly. They want us trapped in their their money cycle. That's big pharma. I mean, that yeah, exactly. But also there are states where it is legal, but municipalities that have banned it. So it's important for everybody to understand where they live, because like, example, in Illinois, it is legal. But in several Chicago suburbs, just this year, in the last several months, they have banned it. And we've been showing these council meetings in our Kratom Gals live stream that we do every Saturday. And it is just heartbreaking sitting there watching these live streams, uh, watching these uh, council meetings, where people get up there and just spew out so much misinformation and propaganda and people believe it. And it's sad and it shouldn't be like that. And I feel bad for people that are in an entire state where it's considered schedule one, as if if you were caught with heroin and go to prison, that's how they're treating Kratom. It's I mean, God, I feel like we could have a whole episode on that. But I'm just glad you're okay and sound like this just happened. Like this was very recent. It was literally Lat, not, um, not a week ago today, actually. It a was week a, ago. It, wow. Yeah, ten, yes. Well, I'm, st- I'm glad you're okay. And you got through that. I can't imagine like, oh my God, to sit here and say like, you're nervous. Like who wouldn't be nervous when they're pulled over? Especially at two o'clock in the morning yeah. as a woman, it's been storming terribly all day. Yeah. Well, pretty much most of the weekend, like, of course. And then I'm driving someone else's vehicle 
it was just so many, wow. unfortunately, a culmination of a, the perfect storm of elements that definitely justified my nervousness and then her behavior and her energy. And then when it came to the kratom, I literally, I swear she was reaching back for the handcuffs until I was like, er, no, ma'am, let me educate you. If it goes down like you're trying to make, oh, we, I, I would have had them call every supervisor. Like it would have been the biggest ordeal for her. And I'm but glad. But technically she, she can't arrest you for Kratom because it's not illegal. But her purpose was saying that I had consumed and was behind the wheel is how she was trying to behave. But again, that's not a thing. But that's not, yeah, it's not a thing. It sounds like she was just trying to reach to get something to be, you know, I'm the boss. I can do whatever I want because I'm the police officer. And even if that means I get to take you to jail, go put the car in compound. And when everything's said and done, you still get to leave. But that she disrupted your life. And wasted my time and money yeah. just to exude God. her power and her authority. Yes, I very much left that interaction with that comprehension of that was her intent. Wow. I'm sorry you went through that. And and I kind of get it. Her being a female in a very predominant male environment, especially up there, I'm sure it's that a hell of a good old boys club. Yeah. But I wasn't the one. And she still, was, you know, we should all be treated the same no matter where we are in this country. This is America, land of the free. We should not be treated like that anywhere. And I'm in Texas, so I'm sure there are plenty of places that where that would be going on in my state, but I'm in a big city, so I don't worry and I, about and it. And again, I never really thought about, as long as I've been using Kratom in as many places as I've traveled with it, I've never had that fear that I now have. Yeah. Like, if I go somewhere, not only being very educated on their laws, but just the thought of, because I've consumed it within that 24 hours, that they could try to levy a DWI on me. Yeah. Like that is right. horrific. And it has definitely unlocked a new level of fear for me, for sure. Like I am really going to re reevaluate when it comes to traveling, like the value gain that I'm going to get from this travel. Because if I have to be without my Kratom or be in fear of use or carrying my Kratom, that's going to ruin my whole experience. Anyways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people are not aware of that. And, you know, I don't know if you heard about Shana Brown last year, early last year. So she lives in Alabama. So that's Kratom is banned there. It's considered schedule one. You, you go to jail for, you go to prison for that. She was using Kratom to get off of drugs. And that's just, you know, a lot of people do that, which is amazing. She drove to Florida where it's legal to buy it, I guess, at a smoke shop. As soon as she crossed past some imaginary state line back in Alabama, she was immediately pulled over. It was all very suspicious circumstances, thrown into jail she still, we got, we raised enough money through advocacy to get her bailed out. To, it took like eight or nine months, but we got her bailed out. She still has this hanging over her. She could face 10 years to life for this. And then there's Marshall Price. There's Marshall Price. That's from Arkansas, where it's banned and considered schedule one. So a couple of years ago, he was cleaning up his life using Kratom, changed his life. I've gotten to know his daughter, Julian, amazing woman. And she said, like, this changed his life. You know, same thing. He was in another state buying it, comes back over and gets pulled over and they throw him in jail. He was sentenced 10 years to life. And so he was three weeks into his sentence, still in the jail before they transferred him to the prison. And under strange circumstances, he was killed. And they think he was, you know, killed by somebody, people that worked there. Like, it was all very suspicious that he was beat up and the staff did not properly address his medical issues. I mean, it was obvious he was beat up and, and he died. And this was a man using a plant to change his life around because to not be one of those people that you not guys be a statistic. speak of and yes, and be a statistic. Yeah, wow. It's just, it's just crazy. And so with you seeing the power of Kratom, you probably want to get more involved in all the advocacy stuff that so many of us are doing because that's how we stay on top of all of this stuff. Like who knew that people have gone to jail for this, that there are states in other areas. Louisiana is really bad. This is legal in Louisiana, but there's different parishes all throughout Louisiana that have banned it and consider it schedule one. You go to jail. And most people function under the general thought process. If I can walk into somewhere and purchase it, that it's legal. 
Right. And that's not how it works. That mean, especially like when I mentioned at 19, you know, the K3 being able to go into, I guess back then it was a tobacco shop that I might have got it from. But if I can access it over the counter, then that means it's within legal realms that I'm doing the right thing. And then very quickly, I started seeing on the news them flipping all these smoke shops because it was illegal. And so I'm sure so many people utilize and access Kratom with the expectation I'm walking in a smoke shop or a gas station, even though those are not the best qualities, these different retail places. So they don't even think to know the laws, to research even within their area. Because I will say when I first was taking it, I never had a thought about the legality of it ever. I don't think any of us did. I mean, I didn't know that there were places it was banned. I just knew that I could, when I discovered it, I just went online, you know, was researching reputable online vendors, found some, ordered it. It was shipped to me. I didn't think anything of it. But as I got in, like I joined the American Cram Association. So they're the lobbying group. And I started getting emails and learning about, oh, it's illegal in this state, this other state. And oh, they want to try to ban it in this one location. It's like, I had no idea. And then it makes you think if you're traveling, like, okay, I need to know this because what if I travel to a state or a city? Like San Diego is banned. San Diego banned it several years ago because of the whole spice and the K2, all that stuff. They banned it. And they, this is what I've been told and what I've heard in other, you know, other uh, resource, uh, sources is that because Kratom was sitting on the shelf next to those products, those. I've heard that too. It got, lumped in, it got lumped in. So they outright banned it in the city of San Diego. So San Diego is illegal. You, yeah, you could probably go to jail. And I used to go to San Diego for a big conference for years uh, before my Kratom journey started. And it's like, oh my God, I would never want to step foot there because I don't want to be terrified the entire time. What if I'm caught with this? It's one thing where some of these places just ban the sale. So those Chicago suburbs, it's just the banning the sale. You know, you, it's not like schedule one narcotic, like in some of these other places. But a lot of these places, they do. They consider Schedule 1. And like, you could go to jail. so extreme, though. Yeah. It's no different than me going to buy thistle or any herb that comes from the many plants that we use. Because, you know, that was one route I was going down, like I mentioned, the herbalistic apothecary way of trying to find solutions. And this essentially is that. And so many people don't look at Kratom and think, hmm, I might need to find out if this is legal where I'm at yeah. and end up in those circumstances. It's one thing, okay, I can understand somebody who's having to drive outside of their state to get it. That probably lets them know like, hey, it's probably not legal, but people who can access it within their state, but then within different cities have the nuances are not. I'm sure they're not thinking of, oh, if I drive to my best friend's house, a county down the road, then I could go to jail and get, like you mentioned, schedule one charges for this. That's so mind blowing. And it's so, it's irrational. That is literally the definition of insanity. This extreme on something that is essentially overall harmless. Right. But they're not for people drinking and driving. You know, the alcohol sales and just, I mean, they shove that down our throats all day long. Well, it's about money, greed, and power. It always is. It's always the underlying factor in all of this. And we know Big Pharma hates Kratom. They hate anything that's natural that helps people because that takes away from their sales. So, yeah, I feel like this is like something we can talk about all day, but I actually need to go take my crate on my, my back and neck. have been hurting with all this weather and I'm due for it. So it's like at least that helps minimize it. This is so awesome, Brett. I feel like I can talk to you all day. I'll definitely have to have you come back on because there's so many cool things to talk about. Yes. And you've been a great guest. So thank you for spending time with us today and telling these stories. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm definitely on board for getting involved in more advocacy with it and just getting involved with with, um, the Kratom Gals and and having a community finally. Because my first year and a half, I really didn't. So it's awesome. Thank you so much for allowing me on. And I look forward to more connections in the future. Thank you for listening. You can get more information at KratomStoriesPodcast.com, including show notes from this episode.